it is a rare occurrence for a car to completely disrupt the automotive landscape. One such car would arrive at the British International Motor Show in October of 1982. With styling heavily influenced by prior concept cars the motoring press dismissed as outlandishly futuristic, the initial reception was mixed. This is the story of the first generation Ford Sierra. For nearly as long as cars have been around, there has existed a strong desire to predict the future. Though most would assume aerodynamics to be a modern concept, the study of airflow and its impact on a car's dynamics was actually heavily studied all the way back to the dawn of the automotive era. The Chrysler Airflow was one of the earliest attempts to apply the science of aerodynamics to a mainstream family car. Inspired by cutting-edge aeronautical studies, Airflow was to serve as an Art Deco flagship. As is often the case with forward-thinking concepts, the Airflow was a failure. The world just wasn't ready for something that appeared so unfamiliar, regardless of how accurately it would predict our future. And as one looks to the future, the relationship of aerodynamics and the automobile would continue to prove just as controversial. Glimpses of Sierra first appeared in 1982 with the introduction of the Probe 3 concept. The revolutionary design was the result of an international who's who of automotive royalty. Patrick Lequemon likely provided some of the French flavor of the overall look of Sierra. Though he was French, he lived most of his life in the UK, which was one of the primary markets for Sierra, so he was viewed by Ford as a perfect fit for Team Sierra. From Germany came Hugh Bonson. Hugh played a major role in convincing Ford execs that aerodynamics were critical to the long-term success of the brand. It was likely only due to his 28-year history with Ford that his radical ideas would see the light of day. And it was a young Swiss-American by the name of Bob Lutz that also contributed to Sierra's development. Lutz shared the vision and passion of others on Team Sierra and helped ensure its journey into the future. The diversity of the design team is evident in the overall look of the Probe 3 concept and Sierra. The traditional chrome-adorned grille was deleted entirely. Bumper design was also revolutionary, with a look that was both harmonious with the rest of the body, while also delivering advanced resilience to minor parking lot kerfuffles. Most controversial was the biplane rear spoiler, a feature no one believed Ford to be so bold as to actually send to production. When Ford announced Probe 3 would serve as the blueprint of a new mid-range offering, few believed the actual car would in any way resemble Probe 3's radical styling, which many described as looking as if it was from outer space. Around the time Sierra was introduced, the UK in particular was awakening from a very dark time in automotive history. Poor quality and a lack of innovation due to strife in the automotive industry would open the door for the Americans to step in. Both Ford and GM were seen as increasingly attractive options as the products they offered steadily improved. Unfortunately for the UK auto industry, this newfound admiration for US-based brands would contribute to its eventual demise. Since 
Sierra would arrive in October of 1982. Its look would send shockwaves the world over. In America, there is probably no other car that could be considered more responsible for the phrase European-like than Sierra. As a young American car enthusiast growing up in the 80s, I saw glimpses of this spaceship on wheels and assumed this amazing car must have come from the same folks that created my favorite PC games, Sierra Online. I had always been interested in the weird and unusual, particularly when it came to cars, and Sierra, regardless of who or where it came from, was intoxicating. It was like that space pod from Sierra Online's Space Quest 3. Even the badge looked as if it belonged on something that would travel in outer space. My young brain could not figure out how our brand new Dodge Diplomat could suddenly be so uncool. Worst of all, this car from the future was unobtainium to those of us stuck in America. Sierra is one of those cars that truly caught my attention as a child because it dared to be different. Compared to my aunt and uncle's shiny new Cutlass Sierra, Sierra was on another level in terms of aerodynamic styling. And to truly put things into perspective, one only needs to look at Sierra's predecessor, the Cortina. The leap from crisp, folded, three-box styling of the Cortina was genuinely revolutionary and controversial. After all, despite how ancient Cortina and its European twin the Taunus were, they were indeed highly respected by the everyday bloke for their faithful service. Sierra's lines were conceived during the late 70s, during the height of the international energy crisis. Love it or hate it, the styling was function over form, reducing the overall coefficient of drag from Cortina's brick-like .45 down to .34. The mission of Sierra was to rescue Ford from irrelevance, to offer a car that was larger than many European offerings while delivering outstanding efficiency. The traditional saloon and boot body style was to be replaced by the more practical hatchback configuration. And then there was the face of Sierra, the boldest statement of the entire project. Gone were the complicated intricacies of yore, replaced with a sleek look that would go on to inspire another automotive legend. Wheel covers were also greatly simplified in the name of aero efficiency, and probably cost as well. Some lower end variants did feature a more traditional grille, just in case the masses were unwilling to adopt the grillless aesthetic. And this was the 80s, so warning lights were front and center. After all, this is in America, and that pesky John Davis is nowhere to be found to complain about the lack of gauges. As a child growing up in Texas during the 80s, my interests were considered odd, or downright weird. My fascination with all things European was elevated to the next level after seeing glimpses of Sierra. My greatest dream was to tour Europe in a Ford Sierra Ghia. The headlamps alone were a revelation compared to the federal spec rectangular sill beam units I was accustomed to. And the cherry on top was the graphic display that informed you of vital details such as doors you had forgotten to close and malfunctioning lighting accoutrements. But all was not roses for Sierra, as my young self had envisioned. As the wraps were taken off for the buying public, the traditional UK market in particular were unsure. While some reveled at the introduction of such a radically styled new car, the more traditional folks were less than impressed. Journalists participated in many jolly old chinwags with potential buyers and came to the conclusion that this most arrow of new Fords would indeed face an uphill battle in gaining the acceptance of the UK and European markets. Even in lesser trim models, for many, Sierra did represent a significant step up in refinement and prestige. In stark contrast to the revolutionary exterior, the powertrain configuration was quite traditional. Power was provided by a vast array of four and six cylinder engines to the rear wheels as opposed to the trendy new front wheel drive configuration. 
The suspension configuration was more advanced than most, as all four wheels were independently suspended. Interiors took inspiration from BMW, with a driver-oriented information center. The standard 4-speed could be upgraded to a 5-speed for better fuel economy. While the styling was cutting edge, many of the powertrains had been around for ages. Rakerless ignition and improved carburetors did provide just enough refinement to maintain interest from the popular fleet customers. In addition to the more traditional grille, lesser trim levels also featured simpler headlight housings that did away with the auxiliary high beam functionality of the upper trim levels. A sleek three-door variant was also offered for Sierra's first two years and was then dropped due to low sales figures. The three-door would make a return, however, as the Cosworth edition in later years. Regardless of configuration, Sierra was a world apart from the Cortina it replaced. Early models did suffer from crosswind stability, a problem Ford addressed with small spoilers that appear aft of the rear side windows. All of this refinement and attention to detail had not gone unnoticed. Even the most toffee-nosed Brits could finally accept this newest of offerings from the traditionally blue-collar brand that is Ford. And Her Majesty was most accepting of the most noble of Sierra offerings, the Ghia. In addition to Ghia's additional front-end lighting units, fog lamps and revised indicators provided a subtle visual upgrade. On the inside, Ghia benefited from such niceties as an analog clock and upgraded upholstery. The XR4i trim level stepped things up with unique wheels and trim. The XR4i shared most exterior and interior features with the more luxury-oriented Kia trim level. The Ultimate Sierra arrived in 1985 with four-wheel drive. Introduced at the Geneva Motor Show, the four-wheel drive was big news as it featured two viscous differentials. This in combination with unique wheels delivered an air of sophistication that attracted the admiration of those in the highest of social standings. All found the interior to be a place worth spending time in, with ergonomics that made most competitors seem utterly common. An estate variant would soon arrive, and was also available in four-wheel drive for the 1986 model year. The rear installing of the estate was the only variant that would not see major change throughout Sierra's lifespan. From the common folks to minor royalty, it may have taken a few years, but Sierra would prove the doubters wrong and serve as one of Ford's crowning achievements. One must go back in time to the dawn of the 80s in the UK market to really understand the uphill row Ford had to till. For more than a decade, the UK car market was in serious turmoil. From labor strikes to rampant cost cutting, times were indeed very dark. And of course, there was also the steadfast adherence to incomprehensible tradition. British Leyland were offering cars that even the most loyal of journalists were visually squeamish to talk about on camera. As was the case in the US, the UK automotive aristocracy seemed to operate in a world of their own, disconnected from the realities of the everyday bloke. Great ideas from the best automotive designers of the era were squandered by rampant cost cutting and abysmal quality control. For years, the public attempted in vain to tell the powers that be that what they really wanted was a simple, economical car. Inevitably, the cars ended up as mere shadows of what they could have been. There was always something amiss. If the styling was right, you could count on electronics more horrifying than the Banshee from Darby O'Gill. If the electrics were in order, the brakes seemed engineered by Mr. Bean himself. Make no mistake, the 70s were a rough time for automotive enthusiasts the world over, but the UK seemed to have pissed off the car gods most of all. I personally have memories of my beloved Uncle Bob proudly presenting us with his recently imported MG, 
only to have to jump out of the thing after a few days as the car rolled off in a ball of flames. All of this is a stark reminder of just how revolutionary Sierra was to the UK and European marketplace. It is easy to forgive and dismiss cars that eventually become common, but one must remember these cars became common because they served us well. And it is the once common that many of us now find comfort in. No matter what part of the world you reside, we can all agree every once in a while, a car comes along that is truly special. For my 10 year old self, there was no car more special than Taurus. But there was also an enormous respect for that European American mashup that was Sierra. Fortunately, as images of Sierra danced in my head, I could take solace in the fact the car it had inspired had just arrived in the form of Taurus. And just as I had given up hope on ever seeing Sierra in person, a certain childhood hero uttered the word, Mercure. I immediately asked my parents to take me to the local Ford dealer. At last, I was face to face with Sierra in the form of the Mercure XR4Ti. It was like seeing the Millennium Falcon. From the turbocharged Lima 4 to the 5 speed manual, this was my home run hero. The Federal bumpers took a little getting used to, but the rest of this Mercure was pure Sierra. As I excitedly read every word of the brochure, I became misty-eyed when I read, and I quote, Mercure XR4Ti isn't here to challenge the competition, but frankly, its objective is to surpass it. Yes, I was a weird child. I was into obscure movies, PC games, and cars. But like many of us, these are the memories that keep us grounded as we face Twilight. So let us embrace the unfamiliar, the different, the unknown. Because regardless of how much we resist, change is what makes us who we are. As we face an uncertain future, we look upon our past for comfort and guidance. Adulting can be hard thanks to all the personal and work-related responsibilities we all have. Dreams of touring the world in these cars of our childhood sometimes dashed by the reality of paying bills and family obligations. But one must never give up. Eventually, the sun will shine again, and we'll all be cruising the nostalgic countryside in our Ford Sierra or Mercure XR4Ti. As a kid, I was never great at baseball, but I knew a home run when I saw it. I hope many of you also have similar memories of these amazing cars of our past. Thanks for watching this video of a childhood favorite, a car that paved the way for another personal automotive hero that years later would inspire me to create the very first cartel. Thanks everyone.
at the top Go all electric, watch your models drop Shifting the second and soon will be Than a trucker, quick as a nail Let's all listen to Joel Burr's cartel 